In this segment, we're going to take a look at burns. There's different mechanisms of injury to burn. So there's thermal burns, chemical burns, and electric burns. Electric burns in particular are characterized by an entry and an exit wound. So the patient may not look like there's much much destruction, but the destruction may be internal. So you, they still have to be completely evaluated for um, internal injury, cardiac conduction system may be affected, renal failure, the kidney could be affected. So that's uh, a special kind of burn. Well, let's look at the different depths of the burn injury. So the superficial burns, really that's just sunburn. So it's just the epidermis that's affected, maybe a little pink, it hurts a little bit, heals, there's going to be no scarring, there's going to be no evidence that it even occurred. Then we get into the deeper layers, so called partial thickness burns, and there's superficial par partial thickness, and there's deep partial thickness. So a superficial par partial thickness burn extends through the epidermis to the kind of the upper layer of the dermis. Um, so, and then the deep partial thickness may extend all the way to the deeper levels of the dermis. So these are usually red or they could be even white looking. They may blister. Um, healing is longer. So two to up to six weeks may or may not be grafting and these are painful. So these are the ones where you're going to see more of a swelling, more of the the changes in capillary permeability or the, the shifts in fluid may occur. The full thickness burn goes all the way through the subcutaneous fat layer. So this full thickness burn is the one associated with eschar. And eschar is that black burned tissue, which means you've destroyed the entire tissue. There's no edema, um, definitely need grafting, and it's damaged all the way through the nerves. So if this occurs, the actual middle of the burn or the full thickness part of the burn, you're not gonna feel any pain. But don't forget, as this burn heals, the patient still is gonna have nerves that are intact as it's going out to the outer layers. So they are still in a lot of pain, even with full thickness burns. But then when that full thickness burns completely heals, you're going to have no sensation whatsoever because the nerves have been damaged. Now let's look at something called the rule of nines. Now the rule of nines is how to calculate the total body surface area burned when a patient comes in and you don't know how much fluid to give them. And we're going to use that number in a formula in a minute. So everything is a multiple of nine. So the whole anterior of the head is worth 4.5. But if it's the whole head, that's 9, and it's a percent. If it is the whole anterior of an arm, that's 4.5. But if it's the anterior and the posterior, then that's 9. The same would be true if it was just the whole forearm, then that's 4.5, because whatever half of the whole arm is. The whole precordium, the whole anterior chest, is 18%. The whole posterior is also 18%. So the leg is twice what the arm is. So with the arm being 4.5 for just the anterior, the leg is 9% for just the anterior and 9% for the posterior. The perineal area is not very many percentage points. It's not very high in percentage. But because it's associated with infection, if there's a severe burn there, then that would be, um, then that would constitute a major burn injury. Anything in the face also constitute a major burn injury because of airway swelling and edema. Okay, so what do we do with these, these numbers, these percentages, once we figure out this rule of nines, is that we have to plug it into something called the Parkland formula. The Parkland formula, tells us the amount of fluid to resuscitate to the patient in the first 24 hours post-burn. So that formula is made up of the patient's weight in kilograms, so if it's in pounds, you have to convert it to kilos, multiplied by their total body surface area, so we're going to get it from here, and then multiplied by something that you're going to have to get from a prescriber, either 2 milliliters, 3 milliliters, 
or four milliliters. And with this big number that you get, you give half of that large amount of milliliters in the first eight hours, and then the second half of that large volume of fluid you give in the subsequent 16 hours. So for example, let's say that a patient comes in who's a 70 kilogram man, 40% of his body surface area has been burned. We're gonna use two milliliters in this example. And he was burned at noon, and now it's eight o'clock at night. So how much should you have given him by eight o'clock at night? So we plug in his weight in kilos, 70 multiplied by 40, and I make, wanna make sure that I make the point that it's the whole number 40%, 40, not 0.4, which is technically 40%. So 70 multiplied by 40 multiplied by two, which is what we picked, and we get this large amount of volume, 5,600 milliliters. So in the first eight hours, you give half of that large number. So if we divide 5,600 by two, we get 2,800 milliliters. Now, that's how much we should have given him. But at that time, you have to know in milliliters per hour. So if you're getting him right at noon when he's burned, right around the time of burn injury, you have to divide this half number by the number of hours that you wanted to go over, because that's all the pump knows is milliliters per hour. So in this example, it's 2,800 divided by eight hours, and the pump will be set at 350 milliliters per hour. The subsequent 16 hours that's left, we give the second half of this large 5,600, 5, which would be also 2,800, only now we divide it by 16 instead of eight hours. So we do slow down the fluid infusion. So that would be 175 milliliters per hour for the remaining 16 hours. Now we're gonna look through the phases of the patient after a burn incident. So there's the immediate phase. So this is the period just immediately after the incident. So priorities for care are always gonna be air, airway, breathing, circulation, starting the IV, stabilizing them, you know, removing the threat, whatever that may be. The emergent phase. So we're gonna spend some time talking about the emergent phase. So why is this phase emergent? This is the phase that the burn patient goes into what's called burn shock. It's also called capillary leak syndrome. So that's just what happens is that when there is a burn, there's that you know, impaired tissue integrity, the, the tissue is now damaged. And this causes the inflammatory response to cause this change in capillary permeability. In other words, the capillaries now have bigger holes in them. And those larger holes allow fluids to leak out of the intravascular space. So now your blood volume is gonna decrease. In addition to just kind of water leaking out, also in this phase, the larger molecules, protein molecules, albumin, is also able to shift out of the intravascular space. So the patient will be losing albumin too. So they're gonna be suffering from a burn shock. Because there are ways that the body is going to maintain normal water balance in the system anyway, the system is going to secrete its hormones to regulate water balance, ADH from the posterior pituitary, acts on the renal tubule and helps water come back into the system. And also aldosterone from the adrenal cortex is going to kick in to try to save the day with the, causing the effect of sodium reabsorbed water following it to try to reabsorb a good vascular volume, good blood pressure. Does that work? No, because until those capillaries are healed, you can have all the water in the vascular space that you could possibly fit in there, but you're still not going to be out of the woods. You're still not going to be out of this burn shock phase until the capillaries heal. Let's look at some of the lab values that are gonna be abnormal in this phase. Potassium because the most abundant intracellular cation is potassium and you have this you know, impaired tissue integrity, therefore your cells are gonna be damaged, the intracellular potassium is gonna be released into the system and you're gonna reflect a higher potassium level. Hematocrit is going to be falsely elevated. 
because in the intravascular space, the, the red blood cells aren't going anywhere. What's shifting out is really just the volume surrounding those red blood cells. So the percentage is going to look hardy, but in reality, they still have um, a hematocrit that is much more diluted than is going to be revealed on your lab panel. So you're going to have a falsely elevated hematocrit. It's going to be a hemoconcentrated hematocrit. B1 and creatinine, well, we talked a little bit about um, pre-renal when we talked about a hypovolemic shock state. And because this is a form of hypovolemic shock, the kidneys are not going to get the sufficient blood flow that's required for that very bloodthirsty organ. So your B1 and creatinine, at least temporarily, are going to start elevating because burn, when burn shock sets in, that you're going to have this acute tubular necrosis now in the kidney, this, this acute kidney injury, this acute pre-renal renal failure, and you're going to have a diminished urine output. That's one of the things we need to really pay attention to in this burn shock phase is the urine output. Is it sufficient? 30 milliliters per hour, that's still really not sufficient to ensure that the system is getting its adequate, adequate fluid to ensure good blood pressure and good perfusion. And you want to make sure urine output in the burn patient is at least 50 milliliters per hour. So it's higher than we're usually going to accept. Arterial blood gas, well, you know, they're probably going to be intubated, mechanically ventilated, but certainly, you know, until that occurs, the system is going to try to compensate. They're going to have a hyperventilation setting in to try to, you know, oxygenate their system. And so when you have an increased rate and in depth of ventilation, how is that reflected on your arterial blood gas? It's going to cause a respiratory alkalosis, at least initially heart rate and any of the shock states, that's the first compensatory mechanism which is for your heart rate to increase. So the patient's going to show tachycardia, blood pressure. Well, it's going to be a phase of burn shock. So your blood pressure is going to be diminished. Central venous pressure, you know, that determinant that shows you the preload. Pressure in the right atrium would be synonymous with your central venous pressure. And your central venous pressures are going to be low. And until you've reestablished good intravascular volume. So that's a low CDP. One of the other organs that you really need to make sure that you, know, you are aware of is the GI mucosa, because this is the candidate that is at high risk for what's called this curling's ulcer. You know, there's going to be ischemia that's occurring systemically, and when your GI system is not getting sufficient perfusion or blood flow, that's when that stress hormones are going to be um, going to be able to uh, wreak even more havoc on that GI mucosa. So this patient is even at higher risk for the stress ulcers that occur in patients that um, are undergoing disease anyway. So very high risk for curling's ulcer. Lactated ringers is usually what's going to what's going to be used as the crystalloid to replenish circulating blood volume. Lactated ringers is the one that has just about the same components as plasma in terms of the sodium, the potassium, the chloride, the bicarb. So you're replenishing what is being lost with the capillary leak syndrome. So other isotonic Fluids could also suffice in terms of reestablishing volume, but lactated ringers does have the added benefit of having the electrolytes in it.